Recording stop. Yeah, now it started. Now you can go. Laser pointer. So you see that there's a slight evolution also of my title. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad to be here, although I would have preferred to be in Trieste. Um, I already mentioned that we are interested in monitoring the transmission of antibiotic resistant bacteria, their resistant genes, and plasmids. And we are studying actually uh, the route from organic fertilizer to soil to crops to produce, which end up in the human gut microbiome. So as organic fertilizer in this talk, I will briefly mention some of the data we have from manure, from digestates and from biosolids. And here's first my tool set, which is pretty different from what is used by most of the colleagues talking here, because most of you exclusively focus on isolates. And we are trying to use cultivation independent methods and cultivation dependent methods because the majority of bacteria in the environment is not accessible to cultivation. So, or at least we do not know their uh, yeah, conditions they need to form colonies on plates. So what we are doing is that we are extracting DNA directly from our samples, and then we can analyze either by PCR or southern blot hybridization, by qPCR or high throughput qPCRs, or by analyzing metagenomes. In parallel, we use a method called exogenous capturing of conjugative or mobilizable elements. And uh, this leads really to the plasmids we are all interested in. And more recently, we are starting also to do plating with or without prior enrichment because we are interested in actually the rare microbiome, those plasmids that are not very uh, present in very abundant populations. So to give you a first uh, taste of the kind of analysis we do in the first step, uh, this is community DNA extracted from manure from farms, from different farms in the Northwest of Germany. And uh, we detect, we target some of the protose range plasmids. So the W that are particular interest of Fernando, the INC-P1, I am very much interested in, but also the INQ plasmids. And you can see that in all these farms, these plasmids are very abundant. So this is not quantitative, this is semi-quantitative. And you can also see that we have the integrases of class one and class two integrons highly abundant. The important thing we should always consider is what is the selective pressure we have in our samples? And here you can see that, for instance, in all these farm manures, or in most of them, antibiotics, in particular the tetracyclines, were detected, but also quinolone antibiotics or sulfonamide antibiotics. Um, of course, the same uh, picture we more or less find when we look at targeted resistant genes and be focused on those that are very frequent, on those that confer resistance to antibiotics that are frequently used in animal husbandry. So sulfonamide resistance and tetracycline resistance, but also the quaternary ammonium compounds. When we do a manure metagenome, so these are now exactly the same manures analyzed by metagenomic sequencing, you see the big advantages here that uh, we can get an idea of the particularly high abundant resistant genes and also of the classes. So uh, this is of course great because we get much more detailed insight. For instance, we never included ERM B or so this is something we learned here. But when we looked at the metagenome uh, for mobile genetic elements, we were pretty frustrated because here you can see 
how few samples were really where we were detecting an INC-P1 or an INC-Q plasmid, some in W plasmids were detected much more abundant, and this was also a surprise, were the plasmids from gram positives. So if you look at the y-axis, you can see this, that they were about tenfold higher in abundance. So, but of course, like this, we just know that there are resistant, certain resistant genes or mobile genetic elements. But when we apply this so-called exogenous capturing, so here we have, for instance, digestate bacteria, uh, which reflect more or less also the manure bacteria, which were mixed with GFP tagged E. coli and on a, made, on a filter overnight. And then we uh, were plating them and selected for the E. coli plus additional resistances such as tetracycline or sulfadiazine resistant. And when you screen them, so you right away you get an idea of uh, the type of plasmids and their acquired genes because we know exactly how this E. coli is, the backbone, uh, or what is the back, uh, background resistance. And a number of resistances were captured together and more or less all of them have these class one integrons. And the number of plasmids we have sequenced, and you can see here that they differ mainly. So this is maybe an interesting case also for the folks that love the sequencing. Uh, so the backbone of INC-P1 plasmids is strikingly conserved. So they are highly uh, similar and you have acquire genes such uh, just in the hotspots of insertion. And here you see that uh, it's mainly the class one integron jumping into one of these hotspots and some integrons were even empty. So they did not have acquired genes and uh, resistant genes, but others did have. So some were pretty complex. And this NP1 epsilon group, uh, this was only discovered end of the 2000, I think it was 2007, the first paper, and now we see them everywhere. And um, of course, there's not only the animals as a source uh, of resistant genes spread into the environment, also the human uh, excretions uh, we have nicely in the biosolids. And we just finished a project and published it in environmental microbiology, where we were looking uh, into 11 different uh, sewage treatment, uh, wastewater treatment plants. And you can see here that uh, the size of the wastewater treatment plant was not really important. So it was negatively correlated actually to most of the resistant genes or antibiotics detected. So where you see red, this means positive correlation. And this is a nice point I can make here. This is correlogram that we have, of course, in the organic fertilizer, we have metal compounds, we have antibiotics and we have quarks. So this is also what comes out from the hospitals. And when you look here, uh, we have nice red, uh, so correlation of INC-P1 and for instance, the INT I1, uh, the INT class one integrons and typical components that you can see here. And of course, we can easily capture from all these biosolids uh, plasmids and the really the vast majority of them belong to the INC-P1 group and most of them to the one INC-P1 epsilon group. So to sum up this first part of my talk, so why are organic fertilizers such as manure, digestates or biosolids, antibiotics, and bacteria carrying plasmid localized multidrug resistances are introduced into our plant product, uh, production systems in the agroecosystem. So another uh, case which I did not show, for which I didn't show your data, 
is irrigation water. Irrigation water certainly also carries many enterobacteria, this conjugative plasmids. And in P1 plasmids and class one integrons, they seem to play, play a key role in the adaptation uh, of their hosts. And this is maybe also important. We should always think about the physiology of the host bacteria. And uh, when we talk also about how this is affecting uh, transfer frequencies. So now I want to move uh, to the plant microbiome. And this is where I always argue, this could be indeed uh, one of the links that we have between environment and the human gut, because we are eating the leaves of lettuce or cilantro, for instance, without uh, heat processing them. So just for those of you who are not so familiar about the plant microbiome, it's actually uh, similar to the human microbiome. Uh, plants have tenfold more uh, bacterial cells and plant cells, and they do play a very important role for the health of the plant. So the typical phyla we have there are the proteobacteria, firmicutes, actinobacteria, and bacteroidetes. And the composition depends very much on the plant species, the cultivar, plant developmental stage, and external driver. So who is localized or colonizing the leaves? They originate from the soil from the seed microbiome, but they can also originate from dust and irrigation water. Now I want to show you uh, one uh, study which really helps me to make some points about sensitivity of different uh, tools we have. So the development of a qPCR system for Inc. F and Inc. I1 and Inc. I2 was actually the basis of this small study uh, because we wanted to apply our systems that were designed in silico, shown with some uh, strains, and then we did DNA extraction, we did exogenous capturing, plating, a transconjugans or tetracycline resistance, and we did um, plating directly from the leaves, uh, from the detached bacteria of the leaves, uh, and by enrichment. And actually the findings are pretty uh, impressive <laughs> because we could right away detect our Inc. F and Inc. I, uh, F2 plasmids in isolates without prior enrichment. So these are all E. coli strains. And when we put leaves overnight in a peptone broth, uh, stored them at 37 degree, we got more or less like a zoo. So it was not a single isolate that came up, but when we characterized these E. coli, they had very different resistance patterns. We detected different genes. Some of them had, for instance, the BLA CTXM1, and um, we had loads of plasmids, in particular the Inc. F and plasmids were frequently detected. So my colleagues in uh, Australia, Stephen Georgievich group, they sequenced 120 of our E. coli from Produce. And I just want to show you uh, these uh, class one integron. Yeah, I should say parts of the classical part uh, class one integron. So my, Laser pointer is not really moving as I want. Uh, so it's a huge diversity. And as you can see, they are in different sequence types. Uh, this clearly indicates also horizontal transfer. But very much to my disappointment, the short read sequences did not allow them to assemble the plasmids that we had detected by PCR. But we were successful in capturing plasmids uh, conferring tetracycline resistance. So we mixed the bacteria from the leaves together with recipient uh, E. coli strains, GFP-tagged, 
and then uh, we played it, uh, these mixes, the matings, uh, onto an agar that's selected for E. coli CV601 plus tetracycline. So in, like this, we were able to directly capture from the community ink P1, ink F1 plasmids and ink F2 and ink I plasmids. So actually this shows <clears throat> that this is a tool that could be, for instance, also used in the hospital to analyze plasmids from different um, yeah, microhabitats of the human, for instance. So, uh, and many of them were conferring multiple resistances. Now comes my lesson. For me, very uh, disappointing at the beginning, but uh, I realized, yes, these DNA-based method, and we talked already about metagenomes, uh, they would be not sensitive enough to detect, for instance, ink F and ink I1 plasmids, for instance, in uh, salad, arugula, or cilantro. But if we do an enrichment, so just uh, without selection, uh, putting them into a, a broth overnight at 37 degrees, all of a sudden you can detect in all the samples F plasmids, you can detect I plasmids, I2, but interestingly, the class one integrons, we could detect without prior enrichment. So they must be abundant, much more abundant in populations uh, that occur more frequently. And maybe also, as we know, they occur on different plasmids. So the conclusions of my talk and maybe some implications for food safety. So why are organic fertilizer and irrigation water bacteria carrying plasmid localized antibiotic resistant genes are introduced, and this is the important thing, together with pollutants, so with antibiotics, with metal compounds, uh, with disinfectants or pesticides into the agroecosystem. And there are nutrients, because this is also a point uh, in the environment, we do not have growth like you observe typically in your tubes uh, with LB. So they are growing very differently in the environment. And still, you can detect transfer events in soils where you introduce, for instance, a labeled ink P1 plasmid. So mobile genetic elements such as plasmids do play a, a very important role for this rapid adaptation of bacterial hosts to diverse micropollutants and uh, the rare microbiome of plants that carries transferable, transferable resistant genes, this might proliferate under selective conditions and uh, transfer uh, resistances required, for instance, by the human gut microbiota. The direct DNA-based methods, they are often not sensitive enough to detect ARGs and MGEs that occur not in the dominant populations, but in the rare microbiome. But uh, that's this we really have to keep in mind. In addition, they are also not suitable to show or to study resistance, uh, gene transferability, or the genetic context. So we need to use a polyphasic approach using the different tool sets. And we propose that the transferable resistome of produce might be a major link between the environment and humans. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And the gentleman on the left-hand side is Julius Kühn, because this is, an, he gave his name to the institute I'm working in. So, and here are a few collaborators on the left corner up there, you see Eva Top. Also, uh, we have many collaboration over the year, or Heike Schmidt from the Netherlands, and the rest, these are my former and present co-worker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Connie. Uh, do we have any questions for Connie? speak up because I don't see who wants to speak from here. 
just ask your question. There's one thing in the chat, Fernando. I'm just trying to read it. So thank you for this interest. Uh, this okay, may be a right. very specific question, but I was struck by your statement that the size of the wastewater treatment plant was negatively correlated with the presence, oops, with the presence of, uh, with the presence of AMR genes. Okay. Do you have a hypothesis? Do you have an hypothesis for what mm -hmm. could be causing this? Is this related to the retention time in the wastewater treatment plant? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Nice question. So actually, uh, the point is that we had this project uh, financed by the German Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, they wanted to find out whether the small treatment plants are less polluted and because there is a new law that from a certain size, uh, the biosolids need to be incinerated or and the phosphorus needs to be recovered, but not from the smaller ones. And actually, the answer is pretty uh, clear that the bigger sewage treatment plants, they use all anaerobic uh, sludge stabilization techniques, while for the small ones, there's only aerobic treatments. And what we did not envisage when we did our experimental design, uh, obviously also whether in the catchment of the sewage treatment plant or hospitals, this is influencing very likely uh, the type of pollutants you have and also the abundance of uh, so-called risk, uh, high risk bacteria. Based on 16S, we have to be very careful using this term, but uh, still, I found this very interesting. It was from Jana Husman, the question. Thanks, yeah. Jana. Okay. And there was a question, it was not a question, of course, it was a request uh, to share the slides. Uh, I said that the, the the talk is recorded, so yeah. Okay, so we can go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks. Now, and let me check. So, is Beshiru here? Probably. Apparently not. No. Okay. So we. So I'm starting to think that I probably missed an email. Now I will check. Okay, so, so we go to the next speaker, who is Fifame Kunimon, uh, and she will talk about, I guess, an antibacterial activity of Terminalia superba bark extracts against multi-drug resistance extended spectrum beta-lactamases producing enterobacteriaceae strains. You have 15 minutes. Are you there? FIFA me. Are you there? Oh my God, she was here yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I saw, I think I saw her name. Okay, next so one I... is, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and then if they come back, they should say something, you know. <clears throat> so uh, the next one is uh, Bright Igere, is Bright there? to talk about implications of plasmids and exogenous or cell-free DNA distribution on microbial resistance. Is Bright Igere there? Oh my God. 
Alice. What did they do? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so no. I don't know because the, the emails were sent for from the secretaries, but we've already had the contributed talk and they contributed the talk. And Roa Meta told me he couldn't and I moved him, although he's not in the I need to move him, but okay. Uh, but I okay. don't know what happened. Really. I'm so sorry. we had we had three contributed talks and mm -hmm. nobody's here. Oh uh, I'm so puzzled. So the only thing we can do now is to allow Pony to speak for an hour more. <laughs> no, How about she's... that, Connie? <laughs> we can have a longer discussion because there are now two additional questions. Yeah, so there yeah. was another there was another there are uh, now two additional question. ones. Yeah. And before I have to write, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. So um, so which one do you want to ask? So answer? Pascal asked, is there a way to ascribe the antibiotic resistant profiles obtained uh, from wastewater treatment plant to the human population alone? So I'm actually not sure whether I uh, completely understand whether he talks about yeah, antibiotic is... profiles. These are the antibiotics we detected or resistance profiles. Maybe you can uh, specify think, this. Yeah, Pascal. but I think she means uh, if uh, you can ascribe these antibiotics to the to being produced profile. by humans. Yeah. Resistant yeah. profiles. She, yeah. Okay. So um, what is quite interesting is that uh, for some of the plasmids, and that's why I thought also the previous talks were, were very interesting for me, you see that you have a, a very stable backbone, uh, depending, of course, on the plasmid types. But uh, in these uh, hotspots for integration of acquired uh, resistances, for instance, or of acquired DNA, uh, you see, of course, integrons having more or less exactly the same uh, resistance genes uh, as for clinical ones. But uh, class one integrons are a nice case to show that you need sometimes very detailed analysis. So Mike Gillings showed that uh, the promoter region of this class one integron from the hospital R751 is different just in a very few um, uh, mutations uh, from those from the environment. And so there is an evolution under the hospital conditions, but very likely the reservoirs are in the environment. So then there is a question from Olivia asking what techniques do you use to link plasmids to the host in the microbiome data? So, and this is indeed a big challenge, I can say. <laughs> and of course the best is you do plating, but um, because then you have the isolates and you know the host. Um, we do sometimes uh, capture the plasmids, but then we use uh, the E. coli carrying the plasmid as donor. Uh, introduce it into soil or in the rhizosphere and look for potential recipients and then uh, identify them by plating. Uh, all the other techniques such as those used by Uli Klumper or also by Masa Shintani a lot uh, using uh, flow cytometry and fish, they give an idea of the transfer range as already st uh, stated yesterday by Fernando, the transfer range is one thing, the replication range is something else. And uh, so like this, for instance, uh, INC-P1 plasmids were even detected in gram-positive bacteria, but we, so I'm actually not aware of isolates carrying INC-P1 plasmids that are gram-positive. 
So um, I wouldn't say that this is true <laughs> for, for, because I don't know. I once saw a paper from Brazil about uh, an Arthrobacter uh, carrying an INC-P1, but I, I was at that time not very convinced. <laughs> okay. So it's, it is a challenge and uh, this linking methods um, that are used, for instance, also in Eva Top's lab, uh, I think they are not easy. Let's say it like this. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the top organizer Ali Sleda, what do you think we should do now? Final oh. call to the speakers today. Well, uh, I think we close this, I don't know, we can discuss something or we can go have a proper dinner. Early. Bright Igere, are you there? Fifame Kunimon, are you there? <laughs> And Abeni Besiru, are you there? It really feels we are doing one of the, you know, the, the beginning of Ghost when they call for Yeah, the... yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, spiritism, eh? Yeah. yeah but, but they vanished in, th uh, in thin so, air. So I think we scared people with the thing of presenting themselves because... Yeah, 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 they... <laughs> Yesterday there were 70 people today that Oh, here, here. 90? Oh, what? Uh, uh, here is uh, Esperance. Hello, sorry, I can do screen sharing. I have a problem that I do not control. But okay. maybe she can send her talk and yeah. then somebody of you can share it. Uh, yeah. Well, she cannot do anything. Ah, she can send the talk to somebody. Yes, direct mail. To Alice. You can send your talk to Alice. I put my email but in. The I don't know if, can you speak? Because if she cannot speak, I can use. you speak? Your, does your microphone work? We don't hear anything. So probably the problem is she has not good contact here, right? So even if she sends the presentation, there's nothing we can do because we yeah, can, no. yeah. Okay. Well, at least you know we know you're there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much for yeah. appearing on this so call. I didn't invite the name of the contributed and I mean, emails and abstracts. There are also the abstracts. Mm -hmm. But I think she was even in the session of when we prepared uh, before the meeting today, because yeah. I remember that I saw her name and she shared. So we were able to share, yeah, but maybe the... Do you want to go out and re-log in? Maybe it works or is it a more serious problem? Alice is talking to Esperance. Yeah, I was. Esperance. Yeah, I was looking at her name in the screen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, anyway, we scared a lot of people. Well, I think... Yesterday we had peaks of 90 participants, 90 connected people, which was out of uh, the total is uh, 126. Hey, it was a lot. And today we yeah, yeah. Now it's 48. It was about yeah, 60. so I, I think Alice, we should finish this. Yes, and start tomorrow fresh. I think be, because so uh, we uh, reconvene tomorrow at 3 p.m. Uh, Central European time. Uh, that's 4 p.m. Uh, UK time, right? I don't know. I you don't know. Okay. I don't live in the UK. Never. Right. Okay. <laughs> 3 p.m. Uh, European it should, time. It should be earlier in UK. Earlier. 2 p.m. Yeah, 2, 2, yeah. 
Mm. That's why I, I sent all the emails with Rome time in yeah, red yeah, yeah. because I didn't want to mess up any, anyone. So it's Rome time and then you change to okay. your time, uh, whatever. Uh, yeah, we cannot do anything else. Then okay. If you want, I can move the and show you the sunset you would be seeing now. <laughs> you took a photo during my talk, I saw it. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so I'm leaving. Okay, bye bye. Thanks to Leave all the speakers the and Look. thanks to all the oh yes, very beautiful. Yeah. So thanks to all the participants, and we reconvene here tomorrow. Okay, bye bye. Have a nice time. Sorry. Oh, bye.